welcome you all in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer. O King of kings and Lord of lords, O Ancient of days, O Holy One, O Almighty One, we bow down at your feet in worship. We bow down just to lift you and exalt you on high, Lord Jesus, because no one else is worthy. No one else is holy. No one else is mighty, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And here we are, Lord, to exalt you, to exalt you, Lord Jesus, because you are worthy of all our praises, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your oil, Lord, that is resting upon us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your peace that gives perfect, Lord, understanding, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name, O Lord Jesus, and we lift you on high. Jesus name we pray amen today we are going to read from Psalms 92 verses 1 and 2 it says it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name O most high to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night Yes, it is good. The Bible says it is good to give thanks to the Lord. And why it is important to read the Bible? Because we it, we just love to spend our day in our own haze. <coughs> facing our own haze. Facing our own problems. We are so problem minded. That we are able to see only problems all around us. That is fully distracting us and we are not able to thank the Lord for all the good things that he has given us and done for us. So Bible says, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. And I want to remind you that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So hold on to the joy. If we hold on to the joy and we thank him, your eyes will open up. The eyes of your heart will open up to see him in full, to see the work of the Lord in full and to thank him and to bless him, to understand and realize that those who are with you are much more than those who stand against you because nothing will be able to stand against you all the days of your life because the Lord of the angel armies is by your side. So we have to shift our focus. We have to be mindful of doing that. We have to be mindful of cutting to, through the darkness. We have to be mindful because we are called to be the light in the darkness. We are the light of the world. So we have to invade the darkness with this light within us. So we have to be mindful of living a life full of thanksgiving and worship and praise and adoration and holding on to the joy. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes, my dear people of God, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So let's hold on to the joy. And let's declare his loving kindness in the morning when we wake up. Let's declare, thank you Lord for your loving kindness. And to declare his faithfulness every night. If only if we can do this, life will be a better place. We'll be able to really enjoy all the good gifts that he's bestowed upon us. All the great and small and little, little blessings that are just around us. Your children like all the shoots around you. So let's open our eyes to see his blessings. Let's not be like uh, focusing on our problems. But let's focus on our God who is bigger than your problem. And let's arise to give him thanks. Let's declare his loving kindness in the morning and his faithfulness every night because he is a faithful, 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 loving Abba Father who never ever leaves or forsakes his people. Even your mother might forsake you. Your mother might forget you. But your Father in heaven will never ever leave you nor forsake you. So I invite the worship team to exalt and to give praises and thanksgiving unto this mighty God who is worthy of all our praises. We serve an awesome God. Come, let's worship this awesome God.
presence of the Lord. We stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord forever.
Jesus, to declare your glory, your honor, and goodness. Yes, Lord Jesus, heaven and earth declares your majesty. So will I, because I was created to worship you. We were created to worship you, to live for you. Here is our life, O Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, we lay it down at the altar. It's to glorify you, Lord. Breathe your fire over us, Lord, and make it a perfect sacrifice.
impossible for the one who holds it all. He has the power to rescue you, to save you. He is your breakthrough. He is your deliverer. He is your great deliverer. He is your holy one, your mighty one. Just embrace him. Just embrace his great love. And just take access to all that he's already opened up for you. Yes, Lord Jesus. Lord, we humble you, Lord Jesus. Yes, oh Lord Jesus. Just one word and you change everything. Your just one word, Lord, makes a big difference in our life. Changes everything, transforms everything, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, let faith arise. Oh heart, believe it. Oh faith, rise up. Faith, rise up. Oh heart, believe it. For nothing is impossible with God. Through him all things are possible. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. Bride of Christ, let your faith arise. For nothing is impossible. Because the breaker goes before you. The one who breaks open every door goes before you. He is the one for you who is able to save you. And if he is there for you, nobody can stand against you all the days of your life. Thank you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord, before our breakthrough. I'll keep praising you. We'll keep praising you, Lord Jesus, because you have shown us that praise is the key to victory. Praise is the key to breakthrough, Lord Jesus. So we will, Lord Jesus, we will keep praising and worshiping you, Lord Jesus, because we are called to worship you. If stars were made to worship, so will I. Because we were made to worship too. We bow down before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We give you all the glory, honor, praise, and worship. Because it all belongs to you, Jesus. For you are worthy of it all, oh, Lord. You are worthy of this life and much more. You are worthy, so worthy, Father. Lord, breathe over us, Lord Jesus. You are fresh fire, Lord Jesus. As we are hungry and thirsty for you, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Jesus, let every hard ground, oh Lord, I speak to their hard ground, be broken in the name of Jesus, be, become pliable in the name of Jesus, that he can mold you and shape you into something beautiful, something mighty. Let your word go deep in us and take root so that we'll be able to bear much fruit, oh Lord. I give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God for a evening. A couple of weeks back, I spoke about the topic of marriage. Explain how important it is for us to understand what marriage is all about and, and that it was God's doing. So I want to start this evening because it's marriage season, a couple of marriages coming up in the family and in our friends and everywhere. So I thought it was important for us to dwell on the subject of marriage. But this evening I'm going to be speaking about after marriage, when the rubber meets the road, what really transpires and how we need to control our anger and all of that. We come to that later. But first of all, let us understand that marriage is God's doing. Because first and most foundationally, marriage is God's doing. We must understand that. And marriage is for God's glory. He gets the glory for the marriage because he's the one who instituted it from the time he created Adam and Eve. In creation itself, he had planned marriage as an integral part of human life. Because when a couple 
speaks their vows on that marriage day. They stand and in the altar and speak those vows to each other and they consummate their vows with a, uh, with a sexual union after that. It's not man or the woman or the pastor, for example, or the parent who is the main actor. But it is God who is. God joins a husband and wife into one flesh, into that one flesh union. After that union is over, the marriage takes place. Okay, great, that's a ceremony. After that, that's when I said the rubber meets the road. And in a few months' time, when the rubber meets the road, issues come up. So this evening, I want to first start by saying, don't go to bed angry. And that's very, very important. Please listen to me. Don't go to bed angry. Now, how many times have you heard this uh, version? I'm sure some of you must have heard this, this marital uh, proverb which has been repeated by so many people, so many pastors give counsel. Many bright-eyed couples, you know, before their marriage, before they take their wedding vows, they go in for free marital counseling and, and happily not to this proverb which says that you should not get angry, you should not go to bed angrily. Yes, they all nod their heads to that. But the issue is after some time, a couple of months, for some, for some it is earlier, some it might be a few days and a few hours. You may, those who are, or rather, those who have been married for some time, may chuckle at themselves and say, oh, let's see how this goes on, how long will it go on. We'll see if they're still smiling and nodding in a few months time when the rubber meets the road, like I said, let's see if they do it. Because once married, the counsel which they are given becomes more complicated, uncomfortable, and at times costly. Because sometimes dealing with anger before bedtime and it's a, it, it's a very dangerous thing. And sometimes, you know, when you have anger before bedtime, it's like you have to complete something before. It's like a, a, trying to complete a basement of a building before, before bedtime. You want to finish it. You want to find peace and, and, and resolve it. I tell you, it's very important because my wife and I know this firsthand because we've met so many couples, so many, many couples who have fought hard over the years, battling each other without subduing anger. And they take that anger to a, a next level until exhaustion, sheer exhaustion subdues both the parties. I've seen that happen when couples keep fighting with each other. And in all of it, achieving a cheap, superficial peace may be easy enough, but a meaningful reconciliation, a real meaningful conciliation which I'm talking about it requires time, time and energy, and also a lot, lot of hard work. It's not easy. Because anger is, a, is an emotion which comes out. Because the counsel, if you really look at it, it is really a good counsel. Because why? Because it's God's counsel. Ephesians 4.26 says, do not let the sun go down 
on your anger. The Bible is very clear on that in Ephesians 4.26. The command covers all aspects of relationships. But marriage in particular, it's the hardest place to apply that <coughs> that counsel of not go to bed, let the sun go down on your anger. Because marriage is the hardest place to apply that. For many of us, marriage is the place where it makes most potential to get angry. And let me tell you, anger is something which comes very often to a lot of people. It happens. And this tendency to towards anger, let me tell you, is not an unsolvable defect in marriage. It's not an unsolvable defect at all in marriage. Let me make that very clear to all of you who are listening to me. It is actually a concept, a consequence, I would say, of what marriage really makes it beautiful. It makes that anger issue sometimes makes it more beautiful in the marriage. We must understand that. Because there is an emotion involved. Marriage, of course, in all the relationship, other relationships I, I talk about, marriage has the higher and more consistent capacity for anger. Why? Because marriage, let me tell you, has a higher and more consistent capacity for intimacy. There is no other relationship which you can have where you can become so intimate with one another other than marriage. There is a lot of intimacy between two people joining in marriage. And therefore, there will be issues, there will be difference of opinion, there will be things which need resolving. Sin hurts more when we have opened and entrusted ourselves completely to someone. When we give ourselves completely and believe it, believe in the other person totally. What happens then? The proximity and the, the vulnerability in living together sometimes make these small sins. Sometimes you feel that it's really, it blows up into some kind of acts of war kind of thing. It blows up completely out of proportion. It may be a small sin, but suddenly it blows up out of, out of all proportions. How many couples fight or put their anger to bed? Let me ask that question. Well, many of the people turn to, if, if, you're, if you're reading the Bible regularly, that is, you would <coughs> turn to Ephesians 5 for the vision on marriage. But the verses immediately before that, that the, that's the one which holds valuable weapons in the right to love each other well. Marriage is all about loving each other. Anger, let me tell you, is a good emotion. It is an emotion. But often, unfortunately, it expresses itself sinfully. That is the issue. Ephesians 4.26 says very clearly, be angry. Okay? You don't have to often hear, in fact, never, let me tell you, will you hear couples being given this counsel. Be angry. No. They're all talked to be careful not to fight with each other and they were, like I said, very cheerfully they would nod their head and look at each other because lovingly at that time 
before marriage everything is sweet, everything is so loving. And so for counseling purposes, you will never hear that at all. Before we try to put anger away, before night that is, we, revert, we need to remember very clearly that anger itself can be a healthy and godly, let me tell you, you can underline that, a godly response to evil. You will find between them, people, husband and wife, when there is a, a godly response to anger, there will be issues, but you will find that they will resolve it. Because in our life together as husband and wife, many of us have, a, have developed a, a map of emotional life in which anger is always out of bounds. There is a relationship between a husband and a wife. The husband knows what the wife hates. The wife knows what the husband hates. So they have their boundaries. They have their emotional map drawn out very clearly. So over a period of time, they're very clear in understanding the emotions of the other person. They understand it very clearly. So they know that when to draw the line, when to not to cross it. And how the emotional life which they do not allow anything to go out of bounds. Because we tend to assume that anger, especially anger directed at us, when we are at the receiving end, we always understand it to be completely unwarranted. It is totally wrong. Why are they doing this? We have that emotion in us. Because we want to defend ourselves immediately against that anger issue. Especially when the anger is directed at, at us. We turn around and say, no, it is completely unwarranted, completely wrong, and so on. All of us think like that, including me. At one time, I really thought about it. But God's word to us, however, oh, let me tell you, you know what he, God says? Be angry and do not sin. That's what God tells us. Be angry and do not sin. Has your marriage, the question is, has your marriage made room for some righteous anger or an offense? Does either of you say, I was wrong, I sinned against you, so I, I am sorry. And for us to understand that it was right for you to be angry against me at that point in time because I did something wrong. You need to acknowledge that. Who or is the party doing the wrong? But unfortunately, unfortunately, many, many marriages suffer because we assume that anger is always bad. We always think that anger is bad. Or we always think that our <coughs> this anger is always justified. We justify our anger in some form or the other. In a lot of marriages we see this happen. Because when we assume the former, it becomes a spouse's anger. It becomes your spouse's anger. And when it becomes the latter, it becomes your, your own anger. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4 puts checks on the anger and how it arises in marriage. If you go in there, you can learn that very clearly. Strive, strive to put away all anger. You need to make an effort. 
You need to make an effort between the husband and wife that we will strive to put away anger. What does Ephesians 4.31 says? Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and, and, and uh, uh, clamor and, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That's what it says. Now some of you may ask me, oh my God, that's a contradiction. Didn't Paul say that be angry and do not sin? There is a tension in what you're saying. But let me tell you, there is no contradiction in the word of God. There's absolutely no contradiction. Much of the, the maturity which comes into marriage and Christian life, let me tell you in general, is actually found. There is a trick to it. There is a, 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 a trick which you need to understand. Is found in the ability to, to understand where seemingly opposite commands are to be given very clearly. Why I'm saying that is, you need to understand in a husband and wife relationship, when to correct the offenses, when to overlook them, when you should speak, when you should be silent, you should keep your mouth shut, when you should be angry over sin. And when you, <coughs> you should be, and when you need to put away all your anger. I remember the story of, of, of Nabal and Abigail. And the story of, of, of how David's people went and, and during the shepherd, uh, uh, you know, sheep rearing time. They sent uh, David sent his his workers around to to to, uh, to Nabal, and Nabal ill treated them. And David was very agitated, and he wanted to just finish this guy. Abigail, the wise woman, came. She understood the situation. Begged with David not to take any action. And she went back to Nepal. But when she went back home, she realized that this guy is totally drunk. He's having a party with a lot of his uh, sheep rearing friends. And then she takes a decision not to talk about this till morning. Let me bring it up in the morning after this guy is sober. Likewise, we need to know when to overlook, when to speak, when to stay silent. All this is a, a decision which you should make between the husband and wife. The message is very clear. Anger has a place in a healthy heart. But let me tell you, there is a proviso. When I say anger has a place in a healthy heart, I'm also putting a proviso. But it is a limited and temporary place. There's a limit to it. Because it's right to be angry and evil, on evil. I have no issues on that. But it is only within a life that actively, persistently lays aside anger. In other words, there is an expiry time. Like all medicines, you will find at the back of that missing expiry date. There is an expiry date. And most anger, let me tell you, because he, 
even if 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 it reaches a wrath and and you're furious and you want to be you know uh, put all these angers against you and and you find your you're the wrong party etc etc god looks at it totally different god gives you even over righteous anger he gives an expiry date and that expiry date let me tell you is nothing else other than today in other words you don't carry that on you finish it discuss it and resolve it immediately because the 24 hour day let me tell you how god created even 24 hours let me tell you a day is a mercy for marriage it's a mercy for marriage be angry and do not sin ephesians 426 says be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger it's very clear there's no ambiguity to it have you ever found out or have you ever thought let me ask you that why did god make a 24 day yeah to uh, sorry a 24 hours long per day why wasn't it made 36 or 48 hours surely there will be hundreds of reasons but god himself tell us and one of them one of the god himself gives us a lot of reasons why we have this 24 hour day but one of them let me tell you is because it checks our anger and keeps it from breaking into a complete wildfire have you ever noticed that you fight you fight you watch you like cats and dogs have issues i'm not talking of who's right and who's wrong the day is over the next day when you get up in the morning you will find most times that you do not have the same framework in your mind to fight the way you did the previous night something gets resolved during that time of sleep during the time when god puts both parties to sleep and he does that with a purpose and you fight in your soul because in this way a 24 hour day it's actually a great mercy for for couples for marriages rather because it carries for you forward to a a uh, uh, a reconciliation it draws a line on the sand to choose between submitting to god and seeking reconciliation or refusing his counsel and keep coddling over your own hurt don't sleep the whole night you can go on thinking about it i know people who do that who don't sleep at all they just keep on thinking about it even they wake up in the morning it's not a new day to find a resolution to resolve the issue no they want to carry it forward and many marriages let me tell you because we have let these offenses harden because we have let them <coughs> harden to bitterness and that bitterness slowly erodes trust it erodes intimacy and that can happen over the days over the weeks over the even over months let me tell you the most important thing in a marriage 
Mark my words, the most important thing in a marriage, trust. Trust is the currency of intimacy. When you are intimate, there should be a trust between the husband and the wife. Once you have that trust, everything else can be resolved, let me tell you. Everything else will find an answer. But unfortunately, spouses squander that trust in a big way. In so many obvious ways. And we can name so many, many ways they do that. Trust can also be squandered in a lot of subtle ways, but one of the most common ways is carrying on and stroking the issues of the past. What happened six months ago? What happened a year back? What happened two years back? Issues are raised and raised and brought forth for a yet another round of battle. Things which have been resolved, things which, which have been understood and forgotten, things which have been put to rest. You dig it up and that becomes another battleground for another day. The initial hurt at that point in time or anger, let me tell you, maybe I have been completely warranted. I'm not talking about it. 100% it might have been warranted. But what I'm trying to say is that warrant had long expired. The expiry date was over for that battle. So why raise it? Why bring it up again? The bitterness, the wounds, and that separates the spouses. Just the way God pushes the sun around the earth each and every day to give us that golden opportunity for us to put away our anger. We need to put our anger away. I can add, if you want another qualification, full reconciliation may be unrealistic sometimes, some days. Sometimes releasing our anger, that when we release that anger from which is inside of us, which is bursting out, it does not mean that all is well in the relationship. No. That's one of the reasons in our home we have a very clear understanding. Peaceful, meaningful reconciliation before you hit the bed. Resolve it that evening. Resolve it. A little time of, of sleep can actually make great allies in the, the process of reconciliation. Like I told you earlier, when you get up in the morning, you don't have the same vigor and vitality to, to fight. You're getting up with a a, a new day in front of you. Now insisting, let me tell you, on full reconciliation, the other end of the spectrum, when you want a full reconciliation in a very, very short time, you know what will happen? That will only prolong the pain and the discord between the two people. I've always seen this happen. It doesn't mean that, that we should allow ourselves to harbor anger or for that matter, you know, settle down for, for, for less than a real 
your forgiveness and reconciliation. No, that's not what I'm recommending. All I'm saying is that we need to be a little patient at times for the warmth and the harmony to fully return before a, a husband and wife can have complete reconciliation. And that's important. And that's what marriage is about. If somebody tells me that there has been no fights at all between a husband and wife all the 50 years of their marriage, no. They're telling lies, absolute lies. But they would have resolved. They would have had fights, but they would have resolved. Fight, resolve. Fight, resolve. And in doing so, you will understand each other. And when you start understanding each other, you will find that the fights are less and less and less. The issues become less because you understood your spouse well. You know what are the things which hurt him. You know the things which are, which makes him angry. You know the things which I should, you should not do. The important lesson here is for both the spouses to resolve regularly, if not daily, to put away all anger. You must resolve yourself, have an understanding. And that understanding comes out of trust. That's the biggest currency you can have for, for intimacy. When you trust each other. And you say that a oh, command, we will not fight, we will not have anger against each other. Because unresolved conflict opens a door for the devil. Please understand that. Ephesians 24, 26, 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give opportunity to who? To the devil. Maybe he would be quicker to resolve the, uh, the conflict in the marriage because if Satan sees that, Satan gets into the act and where there is an unresolved conflict happening in, in a marriage, Satan is the first one to jump into that. He will get in there immediately. Immediately he will. Because Satan has got this way of, of poking and, and, and stirring up unresolved conflict. And he can make it worse than over time, over, over six months or a year or two years, he can make it worse. It's that unresolved conflict which gives Satan every chance and area of our marriage. He will invade those areas. Satan is sitting on the ringside of your marriage, wanting to step in every time. The husband and wife have a conflict. He's a, a, a roadside or, or a, a spectator waiting to get in there. And he will not resolve issues, but he will fight, make them fight more. Because you must understand the devil's work is to accuse and divide the family of God. That is the intention of Satan, to sow discord. To sow, to, to sow discord among the people of God. So if you get into a fight and keep on harboring it, keep on issues without, like I said, the expiry date, no, you keep on prolonging the fight. You know what we are doing? We are just giving the devil we are doing the devil's work for him. He doesn't have to do anything. He'll be sitting on the side and laughing all the way. See these guys, see these two people. I made them fight and let them continue. You can watch, sit next to me and watch the fight go on. An open wound in one area of your marriage 
eventually bleeds into every other area of your marriage. Please hear me very clearly. Satan will start with one thing, but it will end in something else. And when that happens, sleeping on the bed, same bed becomes a difficult. Praying together becomes difficult. Parenting your children becomes difficult. Scheduling your work, your, your time together becomes difficult. Serving becomes difficult. In fact, the, just the existence of your life together becomes harder and harder and harder. And many, many marriages suffer because they ignore the spiritual war against marriage. What does the Bible say? The Bible tells us very clearly we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the, the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I'm going to Ephesians 6, 2, 6 12, sorry. Please understand very clearly, church, every marital battle which you have is first and topmost a spiritual battle. And we will inevitably, I will underline that, inevitably lose the battle if we think that we are only fighting each other. The moment you think that you are fighting each other and that you, it's between the two of you all, you are wrong. Because what you are engaging is a spiritual battle. Every marital battle is a, is a spiritual battle. It's not happening just because of nothing. Treat your spouse. Whatever the sin is, treat it the same way Christ has treated your sin. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving, one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's what the Bible tells. How many, many marital crises and divorces could have been averted in these just 15 words which I just spoke to you if you knew how to get hold of it and apply it to your life. Paul doesn't merely say be kind and forgive one another. No, he doesn't for say that. But what he says is forgive as God has forgiven us in Christ. That's what Paul, the Apostle Paul tells us. God doesn't look just overlook our sins and grudgingly want us to just move on. No. His son bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He received our thorns. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was wounded to heal our wounds. He was crushed and cursed so that we might be forgiven. So church, forgive as you have been forgiven. Let me tell you nothing, nothing you or I suffer in marriage can ask or command more of us than what Christ bore for our sake on that cross of Calvary. Let me tell you that. Many couples, let me tell you, many couples who have practiced this 
they have made a, a startling discovery. You know what that is? Conflict. Sometimes conflict is actually an unusual opportunity for intimacy. You may not believe this, but I'm telling you, it makes you intimate with each other. Your wife may scream at you and shout at you for something, but you know in your heart that she loves you. She loves you more than anything else in this world. Why? When we treat each other's sin just the way Christ has treated ours, we both get to see that experience and more of Jesus in our lives. You see it, you practice it, but I can give you a challenge. When husband and wife learn to live together in harmony, it doesn't matter what your small sins are, as long as you do not allow it to rage into a, a World War II. Be sure you get to see and experience Him on the days that you get along. It's important. Love is the only thing which covers everything, let me tell you. I just want to ask you, what else can a man uh, uh, could make a husband so kind, so gentle, when issues are going around him. And there are issues. The husband says, I do not even know about it. The wife comes to you and says, I'm sorry. I should not have done that to you. The husband turns around and says, I don't even know what you're talking about. It. Forget it. I don't remember it. What else would a wife, what else would compel a wife to forgive that husband again and again when he, when he messes up things? When he does things which does not please her? Think about it. Where would, where else would a love so selfless, so patient, so resilient even come from where? When you get to know each other, the trust is the currency which I'm talking about. <laughs> So what I'm trying to tell you is, husband and wife, be angry over sin. I have no issue on that. Be angry over sin in your marriage. But don't go to bed angry. Resolve that among yourselves. Finally, I just want to ask you, do you want do you want a key to a healthy and happy marriage? Let me tell you the real key. The real key is to pursue something which is much more than your marriage, much more than anything else. And that comes of following Jesus following righteousness and then you will find that life is a blessed 
join him. Both husband and wife enjoy their time. They live whatever years this, the Lord has given them on this earth. But they know how to love each other and carry on. Carry on till the day in eternity where God waits for everybody and gives them that eternal life. So let me tell you that fighting, being angry, is not a bad emotion. Like I explained, it is good as long as you understand the expiry limits for it, as long as you understand that Christ wants you to forgive one another and live all for the glory of his name. Come, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day, Father. Lord, thank you for enabling me to deliver a message on, on anger. Because in this world, Satan uses every opportunity to destroy marriages. Satan destroys marriages and comes in in so many different forms. Just thank you for this word. It's a beautiful word which you have given us to us in Ephesians. We just pray that Lord husband and wife will live together in trust and will live together for the glory of your name and all of it I pray your name will be exalted and glorified in Jesus mighty name I pray Amen Amen Can I have the worship team come and Sing the song before I come back for the benediction.
I'll give you benediction now. May the power of love that raised Jesus from the dead strengthen your inner being for every good work. And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. And all the saints of God said, Amen, Amen. 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 God bless you and uh, see you next week. At the same time at 7 p.m. next Saturday, we'll have a time of worship and sharing of the word. Please do tell your friends, uh, those people who stay in your neighborhood, in your offices, wherever, please tell them about our service. Do join us and we'll have a great time of worship and sharing of the word. God bless you. Keep safe. Thank you. Good night.